of the firm from Migley Snelling, Banks & Co. to Hammond Banner Migley, Snelling, Banks & Co. Then later, Deloitte & Co. And in 1972, Deloitte Haskins and Sales. In 1978, J.D. Banks, as a true innovator and a contributor to society, spearheaded the formation of the Ghana Institute of Taxation as a professional body to train tax professionals in the country. In 1979, the office relocated from the third floor of Coco House to Ibis Court, Fourth Liberation Road, Accra, Ghana. This will go on to become our office location for more than 40 years. After more than 30 years of service and dedication to the Ghanaian firm in 1980, J.D. Bans was succeeded by Joseph Kobina Forsen after his retirement from professional work. J.K. Forsen, the first Ghanaian managing partner, led the Institute of Chartered Accountant Ghana as president from 1982 to 1984. In 1991, Cecilia Nyan was appointed as a partner and became the first female partner in the big four accounting firms in Ghana. She later became the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana from 2008 to 2010. Deloitte Ghana has contributed to three presidents of the ICAG since the inception. Later that year, under the leadership of J.K. Forsen, Deloitte Haskins and Sales, merged with Tete, Asha and Partners, who were representatives of Touche Ross International to form Deloitte and Touche Ghana. In 1992, Dr. Pakosi Indum, a partner of Touche Ross Milwaukee office, USC, relocated to Ghana to help establish Deloitte and Touche West Africa Consulting Division. He later became a renowned politician in Ghana. In 2002, after 20 years of outstanding leadership, J.K. Forsen retired as a managing partner to become chairman of Deloitte Ghana. Sir Chase succeeded him and led the firm from 2002 to 2008 as a managing partner. He is credited with the setting up of the tax and regulatory service line of the firm. In 2003, Deloitte became the first singles global brand with a green dot punctuating Deloitte's new Redmark logo. From 2008, in 2017, Deloitte Ghana was under the leadership of Felix Nanasaki and Andrew Opuni Ampon. In 2009, the green dot was introduced as a call symbol of our global brand, representing all we do in the world instantly. In 2016, Deloitte's logo was rebranded with Deloitte written in black color instead of the earlier blue. In 2017, Charles Labi Odam was appointed country managing partner. Under his leadership, we moved from Ibis Court, Ford Liberation Road, to our present location. The Deloitte Place, plot number 71, off George Walker Bush Highway, North Jolly. In 2018, Deloitte Ghana became part of a large and stronger member firm by joining Deloitte Nigeria to form Deloitte West Africa. Soon after, we became part of Deloitte Africa, reinforcing our position as a leading force in our global organization. In 2020, Daniel Kujo Owusu was appointed country managing partner of the firm. Under his leadership, our ambition is to be the leading professional service firm in Ghana. 2022 marked 75 years of making an impact that matters in Ghana. What started as one person with an idea has grown to the firm we know today. We have been in business for 75 years because people trust us. While we count our successes and milestones, we acknowledge that we could not have done it without our founders, alumni, partners, staff, and clients. Our history shows the kind of impact we can make as individuals and collectively. Today, we are creating our future legacy together. What? Will your impact be?
probably know Deloitte from accounting or maybe assurance, consulting, legal. Well, many possibilities there. But did you know we also offer trainings related to most of these topics? That's the Deloitte Academy. The Academy can help you and your employees develop to the next level, whether you're a world-leading company CEO or run a startup. We focus on professional trainings, such as cybersecurity, and personal ones, such as how to work in a team. Our trainings are as good as what you may expect from the undisputed leader in professional services. We have all the quality and PE accreditations. All trainers are Deloitte professionals who you might know, and they have up-to-date expertise and experience in the field. Because we think interactiveness is essential in trainings, all of them take place in actual classrooms. They differ from smaller to larger groups depending on the topic, so you can use the opportunity to broaden your network and discuss dilemmas in a safe environment. We can also offer our trainings or a custom-made one in-house to you. Want to know what the Academy can do for you or your business? Visit our website. Successful global compliance is demanding. How do you make sure you get the job done? File accurately, on time, in every country and across every process? How do you gain control, visibility, transparency and governance globally and at a local filing level? How do you reduce costs and risks? How do you free up your team's valuable time? How do you look to the future, explore the latest technology, tackle new regulations and plan ahead? How do you leverage the power of your data to deliver real commercial value? At Deloitte, we aim to make your life easier and help you deliver your global compliance successfully. We can also help you to articulate and demonstrate real business value to your stakeholders. We do this in five simple steps. We help you get it done by bringing the wealth of Deloitte's global experience. From our deep in-country experience to provide market insight through to our regional delivery centers, to our centralized coordination teams that support governance globally and control locally. Our My Insight platform integrates visibility into your data collection and processing activities with a seamless process. Deloitte can cleanse, map, and classify your data and make it visible to you through a single hub. Data can then be consolidated, reconciled, and reported, including any required local tax regulatory requirements. Reports can be produced for your statute and business needs. We will be your eyes and ears globally to assist you to understand local changes so that you can gain control of your compliance. By enhancing your compliance management, you can look to reduce the overall cost of delivery and risk. This will free up your people so that they can add more value and help grow your business, meaning you can get more from less. Deloitte's global experience means we are at the forefront when it comes to resource planning, regulatory change, and digital readiness. This, coupled with our innovation labs and market know-how, means we're best placed to work with you and guide you on this journey. We have the experience to help you make practical plans for what we know is coming and to scenario plan for what might be. All of this combined with setting out achievable actions will help you put your best foot forward as you face the future. We help you discover value to find commercial return for your business and free up your talented workforce to keep them challenged and engaged. Get it done. Gain control. More from less. Face the future. Discover value. Deliver confidence. Successful global compliance can be demanding, but Deloitte makes it easier and helps you see beyond.
the lead partner for tax and regulatory services in Deloitte, and I want to especially welcome you all to Deloitte in Dialogue 2023. Uh, this morning, we are going to discuss some interesting topics, and so uh, I wouldn't want to delve so much into it. Um, I want to uh, straight, over, uh, straight hand over to um, our senior manager, Wisdom Kwanu. Uh, who will take us through the topics to be discussed today, and then we move from there. So thanks so much for joining the session today. I believe you will enjoy it, and you are going to have opportunity to ask questions, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, George, and good morning from my side to all of you joining us this morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Uh, to Deloitte's 2023 Tax Outlook uh, webinar. And on this webinar, as we've done in the past years, we are looking to digest the changes to Ghana's tax landscape. And what better time than this time to discuss when we've had the budget read and we've also had uh, some amendments coming through with uh, a few more uh, to go. So as George introduced, my name is Wilton Panu, 
I'm a senior manager with Deloitte Tax Business and I specialize in international tax. And it's again a pleasure to have you join our webinar this morning. Uh, as you know, uh, the Minister in Charge of Finance uh, presented the budget uh, for 2023 on 24th November 2022. And since that announcement, uh, we have had several discussions uh, around what the implications are for some of the various uh, fiscal policies that were proposed in that budget. Indeed, uh, following from the budget reading, we've had Parliament pass a number of um, legislations. Uh, we, we've had the value added tax amendment number two uh, passed. Uh, we've had the revenue administration amendment act, uh, act 10, 86 passed. We've had the electronic transfer levy. Amendment Act 2022, Act 10, 89 passed, uh, it, and they came into force by official gazette, uh, gazette on 29th December 2022. Uh, we also have a number of bills that are pending, and uh, it's at the expectation that once Parliament resumed, those bills will be looked at and passed into law, whether with or without amendments. As they currently are still to be seen. But on this webinar today, what we want to do is to digest these changes and how these changes in particular would uh, impact the, the, the business uh, environment and personal taxes and how we structure our business our activities and be aware of various tax rates going forward. So this webinar is uh, intended uh, to identify the tax rates areas uh, for 2023, where the changes are coming, and what we should be doing by way of compliance when we get into looking at the calendar for uh, 2023, the tax and regulatory calendar. To have a deep discussion uh, and conversation on these areas, I have with me uh, student panelists, uh, from the Deloitte team, uh, we have uh, Gideon Aibo, who is a partner with the tax team, uh, being part of the conversation and providing insights across uh, the uh, various tax changes, the output, the fiscal output, and what we should be expecting. We also have Black Joy Autry, uh, manager with our global employer services, and her area of specialization is in personal income taxes, employee mobility, and all advice related to uh, personal income taxes and mobility. And she is also on hand and would be giving us insight uh, around the changes and around uh, some of the key risks that we should uh, be looking out for. Uh, finally, uh, but not the least, we have Joachim Ousu, a free also a manager uh, specializing in uh, the business tax area and costs and uh, helping clients across these areas, addressing risks uh, proactively and uh, putting together our risk management uh, plans and, and uh, policies to help clients uh, handle their customs and rates and corporate income tax rates. So um, my colleagues uh, will be joining me on this call and will be delving deep into the amendment that we are seeing coming and in fact uh, providing our insights from our experience dealing uh, with issues uh, over the past years, as well as some of the major developments uh, by way of uh, tax cases that have come through. Um, before I go into the amendments, I will allow Gideon to give us a quick overview uh, from a fiscal household aspect. What amendments, uh, the amendments mean, what the GRS poster will be, especially in the uh, current economic circumstances that we find ourselves. So, Gideon, uh, if you are on hand, uh, we'll, we'll take that from you and then we'll zoom straight into amendments. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Wisdom. And um, as you rightly mentioned, um, for the year 2023, we've seen uh, quite a significant number of amendments and uh, proposed amendments uh, which are on the way coming. Um, so, as you rightly mentioned, we'll be looking at some of this and this proposal to discuss. 
And uh, we also know that the tax is a creature of law. So um, aside this general or specific legislation, there has also been some um, a number of um, tax cases decided by the High Court. Um, and this will, is also going to affect uh, uh, the businesses of taxpayers. And some of it, I must admit, do, do provide some clarity uh, because these are questions that have been asked over and over again and we've not been able to get the answer. So uh, this coming up this time, I think this task case is to, will touch just on a couple uh, and some of the areas which we think uh, are quite relevant uh, to our clients and taxpayers at this moment in time. Um, so I'll be assisted by Joachim and uh, we'll be going through the amendments together and then we'll also do the task uh, cases later on at the end. So please hold on and uh, we'll touch and uh, uh, by the end of it everybody will get uh, something that uh, would uh, be relevant to their business and i think one of the things i also want to mention is that um the because we are in very difficult times uh, we expect to see a lot more of uh, tax audits uh, ongoing um we expect to see uh, a, a plan or um, uh, a stricter enforcement of some of these regulations and legislation in the, in the law. And so if there are other areas where previously had been on loot, uh, we do expect that uh, it's, it might not happen, those areas might not be overlooked in 2023. So strictly speaking, all compliance, timelines, deadlines, etc., uh, we are to enforce the GRA, we expect that they will be enforcing them and, and nothing will be taken for granted. We also know the amnesty period has passed, and so uh, it gives them much more impetus, etc., to go ahead and then uh, make sure that they uh, fully implement the law. So, um, Joachim can start uh, on the specifics, and then I'll be chipping in as, uh, and when we go along. So, please, Joachim. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Gideon. Um, so, um, as Gideon has mentioned, our uh, expectation is that there will be more scrutiny uh, if there are areas uh, of taxation that uh, the tax authority uh, has glossed over in the past. Uh, we are in, in, in times of an economic crisis, and there are no two ways about that. And we have an agency uh, to increase domestic revenue. And these are times that, uh, as Gideon has mentioned, that we expect more scrutiny from the tax authority, more audits. Uh, coming our way, and it's also the time that for us as businesses, uh, taxpayers, various sectors, this is the time to have our uh, tax governance mechanism and also ensure uh, full compliance. So we will go into the new amendments. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we sent the budget reading in November last year, so we've had some amendments coming through, uh, which we will discuss now. Uh, but also please pay attention that uh, some of the proposals from the budget remain proposals. They have not yet been passed into law. Uh, so we'll, when we discuss the, the proposed uh, changes from the, the budget and the subsequent bills that have been issued, let's pay attention that they have not yet come into force. Uh, when they do, we'll surely uh, inform our cherished uh, clients and, and, and markets and uh, you will be able to take action from there. But it's important that uh, some of these proposals are in the offing and uh, we know them. So, uh, in the next uh, few slides, we'll be looking at uh, the amendments uh, that have come through. As I mentioned earlier, uh, in December, Parliament passed the value added tax amendment by 2 at uh, 1087. And essentially, uh, what this amendment did was to bring uh, into into four uh, the proposals around VAT chief among uh, those being the increase of the VAT uh, standard rates from fifteen percent from two twelve point five percent to fifteen percent today as we speak and uh, that increase uh, leading uh, to an effective uh, tax rate together with uh, levies of some twenty one point nine percent so that's uh, almost. 22 uh, percent. Then we also had uh, um, the introduction of penalty for non compliance with electronic uh, invoicing requirements. You would recall that uh, 
uh, last year in 2022. Uh, from October, uh, there was an amendment that introduced the certified invoicing system uh, where suppliers, uh, VAT suppliers, uh, were to transition uh, the, the invoicing system to this certified invoicing system in phases. And so, with that, uh, the current amendment has introduced specific uh, monetary uh, punishments for uh, individuals, businesses that fail to to sign up to this certified invoicing system and uh, this uh, penalty uh, is the higher of 50,000 CDs or three times the amount of tax involved. And then also we had a revision of uh, VAT exempt supplies uh, reclassification uh, where now wager and uh, in the betting gaming space, uh, the supply that used to be taxable uh, is now an exempt supply. We we'll look at the implications and also uh, we had some changes around uh, textbooks that were needed to uh, exempted from VAT. So we look at the, the revision of tax rates uh, when this came into, into force. And Joaquin, um, I'm happy for you to provide some insight around this. Uh, if, if, if this is in force already, uh, what businesses uh, should have done? And if there are still businesses that have not done uh, updates to their systems, so what the implications uh, would be? Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, once again, welcome to everyone for this very important session today. Uh, yeah, so clearly, uh, the, the increase uh, in the VAT rates, how does that impact? business and how does that impact me the individual as a consumer obviously uh will affect price of goods and services in the market uh, we we all know that ghana we currently run two schemes of tax reporting we have the standard rate and the flat rate flat rate supplies charges VAT of five percent a part sorry part of uh three percent and uh the level of one percent. So that is why it's on the lower side. This amendment did not affect the bad flat rate scheme, uh, but only affect the standard rate suppliers. But it has not been part of both sides. So for standard rate retail suppliers, whilst you have the opportunity for input claim, then clearly the business in itself, in terms of tax obligations, payments may not be affected because if you buy and you get this additional tax but you have the opportunity to claim it as input. But for the consumer, this is going to affect the final price of product the consumer. Flat rate suppliers are going to be impacted because typically they will buy from either imported products or they will buy from manufacturers who charge by the standard rate. And because they don't have the opportunity to claim the food parts, it's going to form part of their production cost, which essentially will be passed on to the final consumer. So, on all cases, we want to affect compliance uh, and business. We expect that since the effective implementation date was uh, 1st January, if you are a business that you have your own system that implements, uh, it's our recommendation that you should have done the, the changes in your system so that you can effectively charge about 15%. In case you also use the, the GRE part of the for now, the revised play have not been issued, but we expect businesses to able to do the manual the manual adjustment in the phase of their invoices. Just uh, change the four point five to fifteen percent and charge the right tax. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have excuse. We don't do these changes because penalties and interest uh, be applied if, if if we don't do so. We expect in the coming years to improve. Uh, maybe issue the new revised. Value plates, and I think we go into the certified electronic uh, uh, invoicing system. That the intention is to replace the manual invoicing system. We have a centralized uh, invoicing system that the DRE can monitor on real time billings of businesses and how this would impact compliance. So that is also the uh, introduced last year, 2022. The, it was expected that. It's the implementation will commence in uh, October 2022 on phases. Currently, we know 
I'm going to fix your soul. Thanks to your to be selected, and they are going through the integration process. Not all the, uh, the uh, uh, integration has been completed. It's a new system that generally continues to learn from it, and hopefully, given the time that they are given, the timeline the, for phase one implementation was up to 600 uh, large tax PR, uh, large tax PS, uh, which was good, which they estimated to, uh, to, to complete by first quarter of 2023, commencing mm -hmm. last year, October. Mm -hmm. There are still a lot of work to do with even within the 600. Uh, phase two, for medium, medium size tax PS, uh, starting this year up to fourth quarter 2023, and for all other tax payers up to end of that the fourth quarter 2024. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's a new system, generally continue to learn, but we always recommend that uh, tax payers be take steps to consult the GRA, uh, get to understand the implementation requirement, the integration requirement, what IT infrastructure must be put in place to ensure that. When it gets to a tenth implementation, you are already you are ready for a smooth uh, implementation. We know mm -hmm. what happened somewhere last year where uh, some shops mm -hmm. were speaking to the public. I'm not sure any business wants to fall victim of that, but it damages your reputation and all that. So we always recommend take be proactive, take steps to ensure when it's your time, you are fully ready for uh, integration. Right. Mm -hmm. That that that's interesting. Uh, so, um, I think the key uh, takeaways around the revision of the VAT rates is that the amendments came into force and the GRA has issued the notice, making it clear that from 1st January, uh, businesses have to recalibrate and charge the VAT. So, and if you have not done so, then you already need, and it's important that you take these steps uh, to, to correct that. And also, uh, the fact that the flat rate suppliers, uh, there's no change in their rates, or at least on the output side, and uh, flat rate suppliers will continue to charge 3% plus 1% uh, profit levy on, on their supplies. But importantly, um, there, there is still some impact because they typically buy from the standard rate suppliers or imports, and they will be having a pinch of the increase to 21.9% VAT from what we used to have as 19.25. Uh, your point on the uh, certified invoicing system is, is quite um, uh, instructive uh, around the fact that this is being done basis, but like every change uh, potentially requires a lot of resources and assessment. So it's important that taxpayers are looking to be proactive and take readiness assessments and reach out to the GRA or the tax consultants to make assessments and, and put in place the necessary resources to effect this change. So that, that's uh, quite um, instructive to note. And then we also have um, a reclassification of the of wager or state of any form in the, in the gaming industry. So this is an industry that appears to be getting a lot of attention uh, when we get to the income tax side. And there are some proposals. So um, what, what are your thoughts around this uh, for the betting companies uh, now uh, going to be exempt suppliers? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think for the VAT exempt supply, we know for VAT exemption, it means the uh, GRA is taking this outside the scheme of VAT. Uh, and so what, what this means is that if previously they were charging, um, it, it means that um, they are no longer supposed to charge VAT. It's not an exempt supply. However, this has other impacts as well, and not just on the charging. Um, for some of these betting companies, we know they are all related. Uh, they have related parties outside, and they have imported services. Right. And so with the way the VAT input applies, it means that this is now going to be an additional cost to them. It will lead to some additional compliance requirements for this uh, betting and waging entities. Um, then you can also look at the important textbooks and educational materials as well. And that they've also been taken out. So this is an in and out. They've been taken out from the exemption list. 
And so uh, it's quite an extensive, if you look at it, uh, in terms of foreign publications or magazines previously, which would have come uh, without the uh, uh, yeah. VAT. Now they are putting them outside of the ZFM, which means an additional cost, etc. It's also rather here, it means if you are in this sector, either you're an educational institution or etc., it also gives you an extra opportunity that you can start deducting input VAT because once they've been taken away from the exemption list, now input VAT would apply. And so it's a give and take. You have to analyze your situation or your business carefully and then know what applies to you, whether now imported VAT is going to apply to you if you are in a, a, a work, uh, betting or waging industry or gaming industry. And then if you also are imported uh, materials for the printed materials, architectural, magazine, etc. This then now gives you the opportunity to start deducting your input VAT. Right, right. That, that, that's uh, well, well taken and um, quite instructive. So, as you mentioned, it's a, a given take. Uh, so, if you are into import of textbooks and other materials, um, you are now a bad supplier. You would have opportunity to claim, but with our levies, that also means that the uh, consumers uh, could expect some cost increase over them. And also for the betting uh, industry players, so if a betting company uh, being an exempt supplier, uh, you should be looking at what compliance requirements now that comes with where you have payments uh, for uh, imported services. So that, that's that's quite. Uh, important to, to note. I uh, will go on to the uh, other uh, change that we have had come to. Uh, now we've had this benchmark, the uh, value discount policy for some time. Uh, it came as a very interesting policy where uh, the government granted uh, discounts on uh, general goods importation and also uh, we had uh, a discount on imports of uh, Vehicles. Now, uh, the GRA issued a notice, a public notice, that uh, following the budget reading, uh, the government direction to abolish uh, this benchmark value discount policy. And indeed, uh, the notice uh, made it clear that from 1st January, uh, this uh, discount policy uh, has been fully reversed. I, I, I'm sure that. This would cut across because if we are looking at general goods and also uh, vehicles, this uh, would, would cut across in terms of impact. You can help us to understand the extent of this impact. Companies are exposed to their operations uh, largely based on uh, imported goods or inputs and other uh, operations. So, uh, help us understand uh, what the extent of this, this change would be. All right, thank you, Ingo. Um, of course, the we work in China is an important in the economy. So, any change in policy that affects importation affects the economy. It affects every single person. The policy in, before the start of this year granted 30% discount for importation of vehicles and 50% discount for importation of other general goods. So what that, that, that means is that uh, if you import a, a general goods worth of a million dollars, typically duties will have been assessed on the million dollar value of imports made. But for the discount policy, you get 50% discount on it, uh, subject to the customs overvision. That's what we call the benchmark value. You get 50% discount, and then duty, duties will only be assessed on uh, the $500,000 value of uh, import that we made. So that really reduces your import cost by almost a half. So now that the, the policy is reversed, it means that we are going to see an uh, increase in import costs. Your import needs are going to increase. Remember, it comes with other taxes as well. It's directly impacts your VAT as well. So all these costs are going to increase significantly. And this, we expect, will potentially result in general increase in prices. So businesses need to be aware of this. 
And if you want to stay competitive, you have get then how to assess the entire value chain. What can I do to reduce my cost of import? Given that now this cannot be avoided, full duties are going to be assessed uh, on the value of import again. On the flip side too, uh, there have been a lot of you know uh, calls for government to to abolish this thing long time ago, particularly from the local industry that it makes local production uncompetitive because already uh, foreign uh, manufacturers and just have economy of scale so they are able to produce at a lower cost which makes uh, import of goods a bit uh, uh, less expensive compared to uh, manufacturing so now that this policy is the best uh, we expect that uh, potentially to make it to protect the local industry and to the extent that they are able to manage other cost of production. Remember, it's not only costs that impact them, they are able to manage other cost of production. We expect that that will also boost local production and the entire economy as well. So, wisdom, it's after everybody. Uh, after yeah. Most of the things we are seeing now were imported. So, we just have to increase our budget for our consumption. Right. Okay. Right. Um, it affects everybody. I'm um, sure that there will be businesses that are particularly exposed, and that's something that um, the companies should be uh, looking out for. Uh, I know we, we had some uh, transitional provisions uh, from the uh, tax authority in the, in the notice. Um, some were, were, would have been more relevant in the uh, 31st Limbaland. Just um, a brief on what these, these are and, and uh, what. Uh, businesses should should look out for or should have done or should, should be looking at and uh, doing uh, with this and uh, the transitional uh, provision that the uh, authority came out with in this public process. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think it was very important uh, these transitional provisions were were given as part of the uh, the notice that was published by the team because uh, importation is a year-long cycle event. It happens all the time. And you will clearly will have people who would have brought their goods at the port, the, the, the goods at the start, and ready for duty assessment. Maybe the duty assessment will not be completed by the effective date of implementation. What happens to those people? I can only say uh, they are not going to enjoy the discount that was because they enjoyed, given that the goods were physically in Ghana ready for duty assessment. So it was important to create a window for uh, consignment to be accept duty with the discount. So the reversal does not affect uh, such imports. Then, how Ghana duty assessment is done is largely based on self assessment. So mm -hmm. if you import products, you can go into the icon system, make your own self declaration. Tell me, I have this consignment of goods that I'm breaking. These are the contents, these are the values. I want to declare this assess me for duties and I will pay. I will be paid for the goods are right. So if you have this arrangement, assessment fee, then you are paid the goods. Even when the goods has not arrived before pay demand, the reversal has not affected uh, such the importation. Right. And you may also have raised bill of entry, which is still a form of declaration. And it goes is that going post entry, but we don't expect any changes in the duty that is paid. Remember, the key point is that the duty asset that we paid at that time should have been paid before paying January. So if the duty has been paid before paying January, you don't suffer for it. However, if you have made the declaration of this goods, the duties have been assessed, but you have not yet paid the duties. The implication is that from first January or after when the goods were arrived or when you are ready to make the payment, the GIA will do a reassessment. Meaning they will take out the discount that you will have enjoyed uh, on, on the previous day assessment, then a new assessment will be based on you for you to pay. So like the example I gave, if it was a billion dollar duty was assessed on uh, five hundred thousand, now they will reverse and assess the duties on the whole uh, million dollar value of imports that came. So I think it was quite important that the revenue was able to issue these financial provisions to guide the importance. Right. 
So um, thank you very much for that. Um, so benchmark value discount policy uh, fully abolished uh, from 1st January and uh, the implications uh, we have discussed. I know we had some self clearing uh, being introduced as well. Um, just, just maybe in a minute, uh, some of the other key considerations around customs in, in 2023 that we should be looking out for uh, very briefly. Yeah, so I think this is another, also another good initiative uh, by the Rebel uh, Currently, imports, if you want to make your importation, you need to engage the service of custom house agents uh, so that they are able to interface with the GRA to do your declaration for you. So these are people who usually call agents, import or forwarding agents. They are so responsible for ensuring that those are declared uh, uh, from, from, from customers. This arrangement usually put taxpayers in difficulties, particularly because taxpayers usually don't have control over the entire process. They don't have control about what values are assets. These are agents of importers. So whatever they do, they do it on behalf of the importers. The importers are still ultimately responsible for the declarations made by agents. So the agent give wrong declarations, and in the post parents audit, GRA can still reassess you based on the wrong declaration that was made. So this is the opportunity for businesses to take control of the declaration process to be aware that these are the values I'm declaring. And it is correct based on the value of import and giving. It also provides opportunity for business to have access to their import records. This is a big issue uh, in post-parents audit. Usually, usually, taxpayers may be access to additional duties because of lack of documentation. These agents don't work for only one person. They work for a lot of people, so sometimes they are able to get all the import the clearance of information that you want to support your privacy. So this gives you the opportunity to have full access to your data. You know how to manage your import data so that you'll be always ready for GRA during uh, post clearance audit. So that is a very good initiative uh, by the GRA. I just want to touch briefly on uh, the custom uh, guided trade initiative, uh, sorry, the APTA. Uh, we know that we will let you that in turn. Yeah. yeah. After, after has uh, commenced, effective is already effective because it's going through certain phases. Uh, currently, yes, eight countries have signed up to start with the, the implementation. So, countries with Ghana, of course, leading the way Cameroon, Kenya, Rwanda, Egypt, Mauritius, Tanzania, and Tunisia. First consignment of goods traded under the after was between I think between Ghana and Kenya, so which showed the way that Africa we are ready and want to take advantage of this. Okay. It's good and uh, in the face of economic challenges, high flow issues, uh, we encourage business to register with after, get your goods of origin certificate, and once you get it, you are able to trade under the the after that it trades uh, initiative with these countries that we are looking at. Again, yeah. please don't just permit me to mention that the uh, Afro Back Relief is also a cash flow management opportunity that is available to manufacturers. If you're a manufacturer in Ghana, there's an opportunity for you not to pay import banks and levies. As we mentioned earlier, now the effective rate is almost 22%. So if there's any no way you want to reduce your cost of imports, we believe that this is an area you just have to be taxed. Yet take two steps. Yet be a member in good standing with the AGI, and then uh, through that uh, make an application to the AGI, and the rest of the process can follow uh, with the with the with the team. So it's a great opportunity. We are existing in our loss, and we just want to highlight this now that uh, it can become necessary for business to be aware and be ready to take advantage of all these things. Apart from this, uh, there are other custom opportunities that will help business to manage their cash flow. Mm. And we just want to highlight the warehousing regime, for instance, that is available to all. If you don't have all the money to pay your goods, why pay or why go and borrow to pay all your duties? 
when housing is a suspension regime, they suspend the duties you otherwise have to pay now before you can play your goods. Just play your goods through the warehousing regime, duty is suspended as and when you sell the goods from the warehouse, then the duties you get the cash to pay the duties off. Uh, and if you have up to one year to ensure that the goods are clear from the, the, the warehouse. So it's a great opportunity for businesses to manage uh, their cash flow, particularly given that now uh, the discount policy is completely reversed and you are going to be assessed duty on uh, a higher pitch. So businesses will take advantage of that. And this, there's also another key one that we want business to be aware of. Duty drawback is also there in our laws. If you import goods for manufacturing, that you subsequently export the goods outside, you are entitled for a refund. That's why we call the duty drawback. Sure. So you just yeah. have to accomplish uh, putting sufficient documentation. I know a lot of businesses import, process, and exports. I will take advantage of these opportunities that the duty are lost. So businesses should be aware of this and ensure that uh, they take advantage of this. The last thing I want to mention is that. If you look at your import assessment, there's a line that we call IRS tax deposit. This is a 1% tax income tax that is, you know, withheld upfront. So 1%. Now, businesses sometimes may be aware where these taxes are in income taxes they are paying, or are not even aware they can even avoid paying this tax at all. Simple process. Just ensure you provide your team. It only requires that you provide your team. To qualify not to pay uh, this one percent, we believe that this is also a great opportunity that businesses can consider to manage right. their cash flow. Right, right. Thank you very much, Joachim. I think uh, it's it's clear that it's not all green, uh, and of course, in the, especially in these times so of high cost, high inflation, and additional taxes coming our way, uh, we we cannot uh, be losing sight of these uh, opportunities. Uh, um, we will be happy to engage uh, taxpayers, uh, assess opportunities and qualification for some of these opportunities to save um, on cost and, of course, uh, on cash flow. Uh, just a reminder that uh, you um, please put your questions in the in the Q and A chat box. I uh, would also have some time uh, close to the end to allow for live questions. And we've had. Uh, one country that uh, I would want us to address before we even move to uh, the next part of, of the discussion. Uh, this I would ask the video to uh, address. So we have a question uh, from an anonymous attendee um, asking around with the exemption of betting companies from VAT, whether these companies can uh, go on to deregister from VAT and also what happens to credits that they have accrued. Uh, in the past round to this uh, legislation coming into force to exempt their output. So, uh, Gideon, uh, your big thoughts on that and we can move to the next step. Okay, so uh, I think the answer to that is that whilst we await for any uh, guidance or clarification, especially for the betting industry, uh, what I'll say is that having recognized that you have any credit from GRA, you should hold on with any uh, deregistration. Um, we should first of all have to look at where the credit is arising from and whether or not there be a refund uh, of VAT or whether you have to do an offset of VAT against any taxes applicable. So the, uh, in your case, uh, I think I would advise that um, you, you contact your GRA office and uh, ask for an audit to come and confirm your VAT credit first. And then afterwards, it's likely that you might get uh, a set up of this VAT refund if it's confirmed by the audit against your other taxes applicable. Right. Okay. So, thank you very much. Uh, we tread with caution and open communications with your local office. Uh, Gideon, thank you very much. Um, so, we will go on and, and please keep your questions coming. Um, as I mentioned, you will also have the opportunity for live, uh, live questions. I keep your Q and A and other comments in the Q and A chat box. Um, so we also have uh, the electronic transfer levy um, 
Amendment Act Act 1089, which I believe by now we have already uh, enjoyed the, the reduction in levy, so we, we would know. And as you, you may have uh, heard from the budget reading, uh, the government proposed to reduce the rates from 1.5% to, to 1%, and uh, that has since uh, been uh, made effective through this amendment at, at 1089. Um, but then, important to note that, uh, contrary to what the budget proposed to take away the daily uh, threshold of 100 CDs for mobile money transfers and 20,000 for bank transfers, uh, the final amendment act uh, retained um, this this threshold, or it did not change the threshold. That means that the threshold remains, and we are also aware that the implementation has uh, by the letter issued to the charging entities allowed uh, the reduction rate to be effected from 11 uh, January 2023. So uh, we should uh, by now be seeing the reduction in uh, the e uh, rates from 1.5% to 1%. If you still see any charge that is uh, more than 1%, please reach out to your telco. The Ghana Revenue Authority has been clear that where you are overcharged, uh, you have the right to, to refund. So reach out to your uh, service provider, uh, lodge your complaints, and once it's investigated, confirm you will be able uh, to have a uh, refund of any over charges. Uh, we'll go into the proposed amendments and look at uh, what have been proposed. And as I mentioned earlier, the proposals came from the budget in November 2022. We had uh, some acts and legislation being put together uh, before the end of the year that those ones have come into force which we mentioned the benchmark policy was by way of a public notice by the ghana revenue authority that has also come into force and uh, for these proposed amendments they are still uh, yet to come into force because parliament uh, is yet to to pass these ones we expect that uh, once parliament resumes these will be assessed and passed uh, whether as it are or with some amendment. So, broadly, from a personal income tax point of view, uh, the major change that we have from this angle uh, is that the, we have a new uh, tax ban. So, currently, uh, up to now, because this has not yet come to force, the top marginal rate is 30 percent, but the proposal is to take this to 35%. And this um, band you see on the screen is as per the bill uh, that the finance ministry uh, has issued. So we are going to have 35% at the top marginal rates uh, on chargeable income exceeding 50,000 CDs monthly and 600,000 uh, on an annual basis. This may sound high. But what does it mean for us as individuals? Uh, our pockets are a net bill uh, for the business environment and for our attraction um, of experts coming into our space to work. So uh, I have love joy. I uh, will take the next two minutes or so to speak to what uh, this potentially would mean for individuals and also for businesses. So love joy. Uh, okay, thank on. you so much, Mr. Um, so as Wisdom has actually highlighted, looking at the rates on the screen, um, so the proposal is now taking into consideration the minimum wage. So for the annual figures that I will deal with, it's now 4,824, obviously, as we see on the screen. But between the new brackets up to the 25% brackets, sort of, you see there are no changes in the income brackets and then the rates. But because of the introduction of the minimum wage in here, you see that on an annual basis, if you are earning income within this range, there is going to be a tax saving of about 22.20 Ghana CDs on an annual tax, which is equivalent to just a CD. 
identified persons from monthly basis. So this is what we have to look at if they should come to should be passed into law. But the switch here again is that from the 30% bracket, we see that there is an expansion in the income bracket. So instead of the 240,000 that we are currently using, it has been moved to 359 approximately. So now if you are a salary, uh, if you are an individual and you earn in excess of 240,000, but you don't exceed 359,000 Ghana cities, what's going to happen is that you are going to remain in the 25% bracket instead of the debt that you choose to pay taxes on, which is the tax saving point in there. But as outside of this, the government has introduced the 5% tax for people or individuals who are earning beyond 600,000. So if you look at the analysis here, what it means is that government is targeting high earnings. So if you are an individual who is earning beyond 600,000, instead of your topmost margin remaining at 30%, it's going to move to 35. So you're going to suffer an extra 5% tax on your earnings going forward. We, we are just um, waiting for it to be passed, as you mentioned. So for now, we are using the current rate and so then being passed for us to know the effective date to apply this to date. Right, right. Okay. Um, that, that's um, well noted. And there are some other uh, amendments, especially uh, relating to the quantification of uh, variable benefits. Uh, can you uh, share some share some light on that as well? Okay. So just to also highlight from this point, the, the, the tax cash monument is a vital aspect of this discussion. So just to highlight that for the basis of this valuation is centered on your tax, your total cash emolument. And your total cash emolument is your cash benefits and other cash benefits that you receive from employment. The total of that is what we are talking about now. So now if you are receiving a vehicle benefit in terms of coupon or you are given a car or a driver, what the law is saying in option one is that we are calculating 12.5% on this TP that I've explained already. And if we are getting anything beyond 1,500, we are going to cap it at 1,500. Similar understanding transpires in option 2, 3, and 4. So over here, what we are saying or recommending is that now, taxpayers should compare the actual benefit they are giving to individuals in relation to what the valuation would be if they should use this percentage on their TC. If obviously the benefits you are giving to the individual is way lesser than the valuation, it would be advisable to give the benefits as an allowance to go through a graduated rate rather than going for the benefits in kind obviously. So this is the, uh, another area where should it be passed, employers should sit down to analyze and to take tax saving uh, measures from this uh, implementation as well. Right. Right. Thank you very much. Um, so other uh, changes uh, from a personal income tax uh, point of view as uh, post uh, the bill that we have, which is the, the proposal to make amendment. Uh, we have the uh, tax waiver on withdrawal from the territory. Uh, funds which we, we saw during uh, the, the uh, COVID time where government supported uh, with the uh, tax waiver where you withdraw from your uh, personal pension scheme to the tier 3 uh, provident fund. And then also, uh, this, this second point is of interest, so that's where I would say that you make uh, a note on uh, revision of the optional 15% uh, tax rates for uh, resident individuals uh, of the proposal to revise this to 25. So what's this about? What's uh, this revision all about? Uh, okay. Because, yeah. Okay. So currently, you know, we have an option to elect to either tax your investment taxes, like the return, the realization at 15%, or allow it to go through the graduated rate. So this option is, is what has been revised. So instead of 15%, it's now being revised to 25%. So 
Uh, in the past, 15 percent looked like a small value, so people would always select for that 15 percent. But now it's 25 percent. I think uh, taxpayers should look at their income line to know their topmost margin before making such a decision. That's basically what the education is actually about. Right. So uh, individuals with the option uh, for 15%, in this change, that means an increase, uh, where it's an increase to 25%. So reduction uh, for a reduction of net pay, uh, net income, and uh, where individuals even opt to elect for a flat rate on investment gains. Uh, we also have uh, proposals um, that would affect businesses that kind of would, would want to uh, quickly highlight. And uh, we would highlight uh, these in, in uh, our four or five ways. So we have the uh, minimum chargeable income system that has been proposed, which is a novelty uh, proposal to have uh, five percent uh, notional uh, tax, if you like, uh, on turnover for uh, businesses that make uh, losses for consecutive period of five years. So this proposal, which we eventually pass, will be uh, uh, novelty in our tax system for businesses that. And continue to make losses and uh, having to pay 5% of end back uh, as minimum um, tax. So that would be uh, an area that uh, businesses would have to assess. And also, uh, we have the uh, unification of tax carry forward losses. Uh, carry forward of, of uh, tax losses, we currently have businesses uh, in other sectors and then private sectors uh, having three, three years deduction and five years deduction uh, respectively. The proposal is to have all businesses deduct losses for five years so that they, they propose unification, which would be good news, especially for businesses currently uh, under the three-year uh, loss carry forward regime. Then we also have a proposal to uh, revise uh, the temporary uh, tax to so the concessionary tax paid by uh, entities under the temporary concession. Currently, it's one percent. So, if you have an exemption for say seven years or five years, uh, the companies or entities pay corporate tax at the concessionary rate of one percent. The proposal is to increase this to five. Percent and in the budget, uh, in, in the budget reading and the, the mem memorandum to the bill, uh, this is, is to lead to an eventual abolition of uh, this concessionary rate in, in future. So, if the law is passed, then entities that are currently one percent because they are in temporary concession period would have to now pay five percent uh, corporate income. Tax and there is also an introduction of the tax return and the total tax uh, for capital gains. Again, currently, uh, what happens is that businesses, uh, where they realize uh, assets, and uh, there is no specific uh, withholding tax on certain uh, capital asset uh, realization, like land, for instance, which has been an area of debate. The proposal is to introduce a 3% withholding tax uh, for payments of said uh, assets uh, to resident persons and 10% for non-residents and then uh, return to be filed 30 days after the realization. So if again the proposal comes fully into form, then businesses will have uh, a return to file if they make a realization and also those paying would have a withholding tax obligation, uh, which has not been so in the past. And then we also have the uh, restriction on deduction of foreign exchange losses. And that the proposal is that um, whilst we currently under the Income Tax Act 896, uh, businesses are allowed to deduct uh, foreign exchange losses, whether realized or unrealized by operation of uh, Section 25. Of 896, 
the proposal is to restrict that deduction to only where the foreign exchange laws have been actually realized. That's where you have actually made payments uh, for the uh, amounts payable denominated in foreign currency. And uh, that uh, would mean uh, that businesses will not be able to deduct unrealized losses. So, a plethora of, of changes, at least on, on this slide, we have about five uh, that have been proposed. If these come into force, likely uh, it, it businesses will have their own uh, exposures here, but then also will have to think around how um, this impacts them. So, Joaquin, maybe I would, I would say you, you speak uh, on the foreign exchange loss restriction uh, and the, the unification of tax laws is what uh, businesses should, should look out for. Okay, well, thank you. Um, how the proposal is couched now, uh, we, we expect that it, it's, it's going to impose a lot of reporting obligations uh, on businesses in terms of the accounting, booking, and all that. So, uh, now, in fact, there's an expansion clearly from the proposal to include foreign currency holdings. And we are suspecting that because of the, the last year issues of the dollar, the city depreciating, people trying to get foreign, trying to get poor foreign currencies, which in the current law, the that is not specifically provided for as you know a financial instrument that may be subject to this situation. So there's, there's an expansion. So if you have a dollar account or you have any foreign currency account, any revaluation of that value too will be subject to uh, this restriction. So that is very key. Uh, current foreign currency that's always in law that you care on assets. In the existing law, they allow they don't allow for detection of even if where it's of capital nature, they don't allow detection for it subject to the, the restriction. But now strictly you will not it will not be considered for detection. So capitalize it and get detection through capital uh, through capital amount. And the, the interesting part for me is the last bit of this proposal where it's just going to be limited to uh, local transactions will not be considered for exchange losses. A local transaction will not be considered. This is to reiterate the point that businesses generally are not allowed to trade in foreign currencies in the country. So all local transactions generally are not. But there are some local businesses that can get uh, authorization, for example, from the Bank of Ghana to trade in foreign currencies. So the question we ask is that what happened because they are also still that entities, but they are also right to trade in foreign currencies. Uh, to start foreign exchange losses that, that they are right. So, in terms of reporting, businesses then are expected to ensure that they properly characterize their foreign exchange losses. So, first, ensure there's proper recognition of realized and unrealized. That is one. Then, two, part of the now unrealized is not considered. So, the part that is realized, you have to be able to distinguish between what is of revenue nature, what is of capital nature. What relates to local transactions is we able to be able to uh, distinguish between this day to allow for easy tax uh, assessment on this. So that's what I want to say on that unification of tax policies. I think it's a good thing for businesses who were previously under the, the three years. But again, the concern we are we, we, we are raising is that what is the count? Uh, is it is it just going to apply to new laws if we care from the effective year of implementation, or if let's say you have a loss in 2021, which it has to be three years, which will end 22-23-24, can we extend that loss to additional two years, twenty or five years? So we expect maybe some uh, notes from the TRA mm. to maybe provide more clarity, or maybe a certain input will be considered so that the law will be retracted when we get the final one out. Some of these questions that uh, you know may be, may be answered. Just a little bit on the minimum chargeable income system. Uh, as we mentioned, it's over. And we, for instance, we go to Nigeria. Nigeria operate this, has been operating this system for a long time. And their approach is straightforward. 
they, they also give some minimum years of redemption for all businesses. And after that, uh, everybody has to pay. So there is 13 to 20, so everybody is paying tax. Everybody is paying tax. And it's on turnover. So you can imagine the impact can be significant. So uh, a business that is not been paying tax for a long time, uh, but you can look at the impact of sector. No, because of the exploration phase, the exploration development phase, they invest in the capital during that phase. And sometimes it can take longer years before they get into production. So they are in, in this approach, they are making losses. Then when they start production, so they are making losses for five years, they should start paying 5% on takeover. I think that is a huge, and maybe we expect that there will be further negotiations, discussions with, uh, between the extractive sector. And the government to see whether certain concessions may be granted today. Right, right. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I've already seen a lot of give, give and take, as video mentioned earlier, and also uh, you, you also strongly see the uh, the pending sharing uh, team where now more businesses are paying and uh, more taxes, and then also we have the growth and sustainability level. The growth and sustainability level. And I look at the table and it seems uh, almost everyone is on here. Uh, Joachim, what's all this about? Yeah, I think the growth and sustainability level. Exactly. We, yeah. we want to rebuild our country, all of us together. So uh, yeah. all businesses are now going to move into uh, the growth and sustainability level. As this team, Levy is National Capital Stabilization Levy that just um, eight sectors were paid, right? Five percent eight sectors were paid, but right now it's expanded uh, to include all businesses based on the categories. So, category A, about 13 sectors are listed. Category B is the extractive sector, mining, and after oil and gas companies. And look, that is one percent of the gross production. That can be very significant, right? We know there are concerns around their stability crosses in their respective mining licenses of petroleum agreements that potentially we, 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 the government the government will be, be, be trying to abuse that. So those bigger questions are being raised and we mm -hmm. we believe and we know certain discussions are ongoing to see how this particular thing can be implemented. Of course, uh, businesses in these categories are worried and expect them to continue to engage in this area. And all other businesses, or if you are not within category A and B, then you clearly fall within a 2.5% bracket. The last yeah. thing I want to mention is that the, the bill state that these are entities. So, what, what happened to super prices? Uh, are they yeah. also? Included in this budget share of the aesthetical included. We, I think we expect more uh, guidance from the GRE before the implementation of this. Right. Okay. Well, right. thank you very much. Uh, all entities, uh, growth and uh, sustainability levy. Gideon, uh, you, you, you have a comment? Yeah, I think a comment on the proposed, this session of the proposed amendments for the yeah. concessions. And then also for the uh, fiscal stability level, which has gone to growth and sustainability level. Yeah. I think uh, we are hoping that maybe before these uh, laws uh, have become effective, there will be a bit more uh, deliberations or with uh, affected parties because mm -hmm. it's going to increase. Of course, there's a need for additional revenue, but it's going to increase the effective tax rates for uh, all taxpayers. And yeah. then, uh, especially where the questions are around, especially for the concessions, uh, we talk about agriculture, etc., uh, that they've been paying 1% of charitable income all this while, and all of a sudden, it's going to 5%. Um, are they also going to be affected here? Uh, yeah. Because there's a category C, which is capturing everybody. I think yeah. we need a bit more guidelines or certification in the law so that uh, certain entities would also be excluded. Uh, from this, uh, all other category C, category A have already been there already, but uh, with the additional ones of the B and C, it might need a little bit more of uh, deliberations with affected parties. Yeah. And uh, for another point of concern is that on the temporary concession, 
Uh, I know this is still a bill, but when you look at the memo under which you went to Parliament, um, it, it talks about the fact that these concessions are gradually going to be phased out. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. part of the law, but it's also for somebody who is in the sector, uh, all those entities, that would mean the farming, agriculture, uh, residential or waste process, and all those who have been benefiting from these temporary concessions will then be G3 at this moment because uh, they, looking at it, it is not going to last forever. Even the 5% now uh, is on shaky ground. Eventually, they might see further or additional increments here. Mm. Yes, if you may allow me to come in briefly to yeah. add something to what just uh, Gideon said um, regarding this uh, growth and stabilization levy. Uh, I think it's also important that um, we, we know that some companies, especially within the oil and gas sector and the mining sector, have specific stabilities or agreements with the government um, of Ghana and so with this introduction, definitely there will be some discussions or negotiations as to these companies, whether they will be included in the payment of these taxes or not, because they have agreements which um, does not um, allow for any additional taxes. But then uh, I believe that some negotiations, and I'm aware that some negotiations have already started around that sector. Uh, and so by the time the law actually comes up, I believe that there will be some clarities around uh, businesses in those sectors that have specific exemptions um, in their agreements. Okay, right. So businesses with fiscal stability. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so, still some more proposed amendments, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the betting and gaming industry is seeing a lot of attention, and uh, this is not uh, a surprise uh, because they the GME has already mentioned that the units have been set up to review this sector and uh, with, with the uh, proposal uh, coming through. The proposal uh, is that for from an income tax uh, point of view, uh, gaming and betting companies uh, will have uh, a 20% uh, income tax in lieu of, of their corporate tax, their gross gaming uh, revenue and that uh, gross gaming revenue uh, will be total amounts of stakes and uh, that they take less winnings. So uh, if this comes true, it means that um, gaming uh, businesses or companies in the uh, betting and gaming sector will now be paying uh, a corporate tax, something at the, at the top level uh, indicator and not the tangible profit that we have for the general sector. And uh, this is something that uh, anyone in this space should pay uh, keen attention to in addition to the past uh, proposed past uh, change, the past change that has indeed already uh, come into effect with the past amendment act. And also payment for winnings uh, from lottery to be subject to final withholding tax of 10%. So again, businesses uh, operating gaming uh, and uh, lottery business uh, would have to now withhold 10% uh, from winning payments, and that would be final for uh, the person that win uh, from this betting uh, gaming space. So, this is part of the proposed uh, amendments currently in the bill, and once Parliament uh, puts this uh, into effect with the uh, presidential assets and uh, the changes will come through or whatever additional changes that uh, may come through as this is being reviewed in Parliament. So very important for us to take note of. Uh, we'll go into our session. Uh, so with all these changes, uh, we'll go into our session where we highlight uh, so the question around with all these changes, where do we see uh, the, the tax rates as Indian mentioned earlier, we have to now situate any discussion around tax compliance, tax governance uh, in, in the context of a country that needs to raise domestic revenue, which indeed uh, we have to, with our 13.5% thereabouts tax to GDP, we have to raise our tax revenue for businesses 
it's important that we identify the risk areas um, and closing any risk gaps so, so that we are paying the taxes, uh, our fair share of taxes and not exposed to interest and penalties. So uh, we start off looking at some of the, with all the happenings uh, from past years, audits we've been engaged in, task cases that have come through. Some of the key risks 2023 we should not miss and we should not fall uh, found to. Uh, so we start off uh, by looking at this three and the Joachim, I would invite you to again uh, to, to speak to, to these three points uh, that as part of where the risks are and what we should be looking out for. Okay, Lisa, thank you. So, um, entities, you know, uh, branch, when foreigners, foreign companies want to set up here, uh, they have option to decide which entity that they want to register. And typically, they will register uh, external companies, which generally known as branch offices, to represent them, maybe provide some short term activities on their behalf. How branch of, uh, branches or external companies are taxed are not entirely different from how general subsidiary companies or development companies are taxed. But when branch with profits, uh, there are, there's a requirement that this branch will pay what we call repatriated profits on whatever net profit they earn whilst they operate uh, in the country. So if you take certain steps that they are stability process that protects companies on how much tax they, they can pay, particularly look at the petroleum sector where their peers provide certain specific rates of tax that they pay and stability process block those rates. Subsequent amendment law that not affect those rates. Then you have a challenge of okay, is that the only tax they, they have to pay or there are additional taxes that we can use African regulations uh, pay. Uh, I know there are so for cases that uh, this 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 particular issue went to court and there, there was a judgment of it. I know we go into the case, but it's an area that we want companies to be aware of. If you have branch operation, remember after you pay the branch pays the corporate tax of 25 percent, there is an extra eight percent branch repatriated profit that have to be assessed and paid to the GRI. A lot of branches, as we know, may not be aware, and this is an area I want to highlight because it has been an area of litigation that the court has pronounced on. Now, the big issue for us in, in 2022 was in respect of trade discounts. Um, discounts you know, have not been a big issue in the past until the DRA maybe took a view to scrutinize discounts, subject discounts to the strict application of the law, the tax laws in Ghana. And companies who were considered not to have applied their discount policies uh, to the full uh, uh, segment of the law have seen their discount policy recharacterized, for instance, recharacterized as commission and being subject to uh, tax, withholding tax on the commission. The main risk has to do with how you account for the discounts. What if you account for the discounts? You should account for the discounts if discounts is given. On transactions, then when you are using your bank invoice, be sure that this account is being accounted for on your bank invoice. Because invoice discount can also be issued, but how do you account for it? There are specific rules around how you can account for post uh, invoice discounts. Uh, the law provides specific provisions on how you can adjust issue a credit rule to ensure that the discount is properly accounted for. Anything other than this, you subject your business to significant risks. Especially if you are a large company that have discount policies across it, it may be significant to the revenue you pay, then uh, you may be subjecting your business to significant risk of potential recapitalization by the GRE. Another issue that has been contested for a long time has been withholding tax on payment to HR service providers. This business is sought for qualified, qualified uh, personnel. They have their stock or businesses who want to employ boss. Maybe they don't want to take the responsibility of tax filing, contract negotiation, 
slave payment. They go through this HR service providers for them to stop for staff and then give second this staff to this candidate. Now, these HR service providers earn uh, their income less than a percentage of whatever salaries you pay to uh, this, uh, this personnel. When they issue their invoice, it is the cost of this staff, which is their salaries and their management fees. The issue has been that should be total tax apply on the entire inward value, i.e. the salaries plus their commission plus their management fees, or we told you that should only apply on the management fees. These two positions have been held depends on maybe who you meet on the tax for day and how you argue your, your case. In some instances, we receive the GRA accept you know an explanation that hey this salary this salaries POI have been paid on this salaries. So if you subject yeah. the salaries to additional returning tax, that will be double taxation. So exclude. In some instances where you are able to show that indeed the POI was paid on the salaries, that means it depends on the team. But it was a general practice that this team may accept not to uh, apply the utility tax money. And there are some team who will take a very aggressive position, a stricter position of the law and say that the business of these people is to supply staff. And supply of staff is, a, is an activity that you do. You, you, you so we told you tax is not applied to the profit you make on these activities. Mm -hmm. It's applied to your cost plus profit. So then, to the tax to apply the total invoice amount. So, this has been an issue of contention. And it's good that now we have this law to settle the arguments and it brings more clarity to, to businesses who make a payment to these data service providers. So, there's right. an other general compliance rates documentation. We always talk about it, how you account for your PAT. Uh, if it is really put it under relief, don't put it under standard. If it's uh, then put it under exempt, don't put it under any other color. If you are not properly report it well, then it will be subject to other interpretation which may you know expose the, the business big time. Right. Right. Thank you, Jackie. Um uh, very key key rates, grant profits, dividend, uh tax withholding, sometimes uh, businesses uh Miss to to apply the withholding accordingly, and then the trade discounts again. We will we'll delve a bit into that and then we can look at that in the uh, real world scenario. Um, withholding tax on payments. I know. So all this discussion, there will be something around what the documentation should be and all that. So, um, love job uh, any comments, inputs uh, on uh, the income service provider. Uh, aspects and what sufficient documentation uh, would mean. Okay, so for HR providers, those uh, outsourcing contract staff to uh, companies. So now, for the company who's receiving these contract staff, in the past might not be concerned with what the PUI should work. But uh, with this judgment and with this case, it's obvious here that you should be concerned with the PAY of the contract staff and make sure that on monthly basis they are filing and making the right payment because that will be the documents that you will need to support the arguments when PAY should come for an audit and to say they want to withhold on the reinvestable amount. And another portion that I think we will draw in is the fact that when raising such invoices, I think it has to be split into service fee and then the reinvestable, which is the cost of staff. So that is clearly seen on the invoice and that this is what's related to the service and this is what relates to employee costs. And a lot of reconciliation has to be done, both at the outsourcing agent side and then the company receiving its contract staff. Making sure that on a monthly basis the cost, the staff cost, reconciles with the returns and the payments made, so that it's quite easy during audits. There are a lot of documentation that has already been done, a lot of reconciliation that has already been put together. So when the GRE officials come for their audits, they will just be pulling documents to them for them to be able to see the right things have been put in place already. Okay, uh, very, very. Very important um, to to look at that, and also we will we'll be looking at how 
these have played out in some of the recent tax cases that we've had uh, ruled on in the courts in, in Ghana. Um, so we, we selected three cases uh, that we thought we should highlight uh, around some of the happenings from the tax uh, space and what uh, our service uh, clients and the market should be looking out for. Now, the, the first one is um, the so called Orica case, the Orica Ghana Limited uh, versus the uh, Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority. Now, um, Orica Ghana Limited is a manufacturer. Um, they also assemble and sell both commercial explosives in the, the mining industry. And uh, this uh, case uh, is around an audit that was conducted by the Ghana Revenue Authority. And in that audit, the uh, Ghana Revenue Authority uh, identified that whilst the company uh, was mainly into manufacturing of commercial explosives, uh, they also had other services uh, that they would um, uh, provide alongside their manufacturing such as transportation of the explosives to their various customers. And um, as you may be aware, the company being a manufacturing company situated outside Accra, outside regional capital, was enjoying uh, concessionary rates uh, of corporate tax on their income. And the GME was of the view that the income, the, the, the lower corporate tax rate should be applied on only manufacturing income and not the other services that come with the manufacturing. Of course, the tax payer disagree and uh, thought that those other services uh, should be treated as part of the, the manufacturing process. So, whilst the, the tax payer, uh, so from the, the disagreement, the tax payer then proceeded uh, to appeal to the Court and the court ruled uh, to disagree with the TRA, uh, ruling in favor of the taxpayer, uh, considering that the services are ancillary uh, to the manufacturing uh, uh, activities. So, uh, Joaquin, I would again call on you what uh, this would mean, what we can, what would be the takeaways from, from this case, and uh, how it panned out, and what are the key aims of the taxpayer. Uh, had had ruling in its favor, but what can businesses learn uh, from what transpired in this case? Okay, thank you, Mister. Um, so I, I think this, this was a case to the taxpayer. Uh, on the face of it, uh, if you ask me, if I'm to clearly separate your service activity from your manufacturing activities. And your impression is going to vary on the field of it, which suggests that you yourself know that these are separate from manufacturing activities. But that is the reason as you have it now. And given as it may, the, 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 the impact of this building is that if you are a business and you are set up to do certain activities, all other activities that you do within to be have been conducted in a central operation, central operation. And that's why the court concluded that based on that foundation, yes, this they are very set up to do uh, manufacturing of explosives, but maybe these services or this transportation service are ancillary to the, the manufacturing activities they do. We will ask the question uh, who can handle explosives better than the manufacturer? The manufacturer that and this it, and these are explosives. So, if the manufacturer is taking additional responsibility to ensure that these explosives are transported to a, a, a place designated by the, the customer, then you cannot uh, consider that as a separate activity of of the manufacturer. So, it was a it was a, in favor of the of the manufacturer of the taxpayer, and they enjoyed the they enjoyed the the lower tax rates. Also on the service key as well, but businesses, um, we expect businesses to properly, you know, analyze their business operation. They are said it's not all activities that you do 
in your business that they will construe as and zero it to your services. So, for instance, if you take, let's say, you take the rural bank that have concessionary rates, so the first 10 years, either to pay 1%, the proposal you pay 5%. So, you are a rural bank, your business is, is in banking. If you go and construct offices and you rent out, you don't expect that the renting activity can be construed as having been conducted as a single unit as a banking official. So it's not of course, and we have to always be aware and analyze our business situation before we apply applications of this product. Right. Right. Uh, that, that's, that's very, that's very insightful and, and key. So my takeaway is that, um, so it's not one size fits all. It's always important that you conduct uh, an objective test of what your activities are and where you indeed fall. That's, that's very insightful. And then you also have uh, another very, very important uh, case that, that came through in 2022, Coca-Cola Victoria Capital Limited and the uh, Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority. And it did, uh, in this case, uh, there were about six issues for the court to rule on uh, state very, very important tax issues that the court had to rule on. We have taken three of these issues uh, to to just highlight for the purpose of this discussion and also highlight what it means uh, for business. Uh, the, the first issue we are looking at uh, is around expenses relating to staff salaries uh, paid to a service provider uh, for the company. Uh, so a service provider sourcing staff to the company. And as Joachim had mentioned earlier, this has been a debatable area around what the withholding tax should apply for. So in the taxpayers' uh, case, or in this particular case, uh, Coca-Cola and Victoria Capital Limited uh, did not withhold on the salary aspect reimbursed to the outsourcing company, but the GRA uh, had a different uh, view and treated the amount of dollars and respect that uh, should uh, attract withholding tax. And we also have the issue around trade discounts to customers, again, a very bitter issue, um, in, in, especially in the fast moving consumer uh, space where various incentives are given to customers and uh, there, there are cases where the GRA recharacterizes those uh, the incentives. And in this case, the GRA recharacterized trade discounts that the company had offered uh, to businesses uh, based on targets that the each customer based on targets that the uh, customers meet at the end of the year. And they are giving discounts on uh, the, the, the sales that they have made. Uh, previously, and again, uh, there was also the issue around whether VAT should apply on various support services that Coca Cola and Victoria are providing to its related party uh, in, in, in the US state, and uh, whether those services should be considered as consumed in Ghana and should attract uh, VAT or should be considered. As consumed outside Ghana and uh, be treated as exported services. So, doing out of state uh, legal issues that the court had to determine. And I'll call on uh, Gideon uh, to touch on, on this very briefly how the court concluded uh, on these issues and what the implications are for businesses going forward. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, the first one on the HR uh, PY thing has been talked about twice, so I would uh, go on to the next one in terms of the royalty uh, um, withholding. And I think uh, this is also quite set some of the standards in terms of the documentation uh, needed, especially when there's a GRA audit. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of, because in this case, um, the uh, Taxpayer, that's Coca-Cola Pretoria, then which I want to say is different from the bottling company. 
um, is that they have been providing certain services, so advertising, brand, uh, marketing, etc., and other support services to a Coca-Cola affiliate outside of the country. And so there had been some royalty payments, I think, on another shareholding that they owned. But the thing was that uh, they didn't provide all the information or documentation to the GRA. And so when he went to court, uh, the court sided with GRA uh, in terms of that the needed documentation that the taxpayer should have provided wasn't made available to the GRA to be able to uh, determine uh, the right amount of taxes. And the judge also made mention to one of the provisions in the Revenue Administration Act, which says that when a case goes to court, the onus is on the taxpayer to provide uh, evidence or proof. So if the taxpayer has not been able to provide the necessary proof, uh, then uh, the court will side with the revenue authority. So I think this is something that we should all be aware. Uh, when there's an outgoing audit and there's uh, needed information or certain uh, information asked by the GRA, please go ahead to provide. In this case, the GRA asked for uh, an asset uh, purchase agreement. Um, but the taxpayer, <clears throat> sorry, didn't provide this. They rather went ahead to provide bank transfer advice. They provided a bill of sale, etc. Uh, but not the specific information that the GRA uh, requested. And on this basis, although I would have been interested uh, to find out what the actual tax implication is, the judge grew based on the technicality. Uh, the other one I wanted, I think, uh, Joachim also touched briefly on that, is on a discount to commission. In this case, the uh, Commissioner General exercises powers under Section 34 of Act 896, which says that he can recharacterize certain transactions. And so, what happened in this case? So, um, uh, here the judge or made reference to uh, if you'll be aware, a uh, fan mill case and a buy off case, which were all similar around uh, discounts provided to an agent or a sales agent. Uh, in, the, in this case, the judge went ahead to mention the, for the fact that uh, there was no mention of a trade discount on the face of the invoice, VAT invoice. And he said that the presence of a discount of VAT on the invoice is one of the cogent ways to prove that it is a discount and not a commission. Uh, so, because the client, the taxpayer didn't mention the discounts on the face of the invoice, the judge went ahead to rule uh, against the taxpayer that, well, the GRA is right. Uh, we think this is a commission being disguised at the trade discount. Uh, I feel that, well, um, you could mention or a discount could be provided not mentioning the exact invoice, but maybe. A subsequent invoice. The judge didn't go ahead to mention that, but one of the main reasons or my take home point from this is that based on the VAT regulation, uh, whenever you're providing discounts to your agents or your customers, please make sure that you put it on the face, you put the rate of the discount on the face of the invoice. So if you are own internally generated VAT invoice, please make sure that you add this on the face of the invoice. And the last part uh, I want to touch on is on the supply of services consumed outside of Ghana. And this is also provide a lot more clarity on how the VAT rules apply in terms of the place of supply rules. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, in this case, the Ghana servicing company has provided support services from Ghana to Coca-Cola USA. And the point of uh, contention here is whether the service being supplied here should be zero rated or the standard rating. And if it's going to be zero rated if it's seen as having been exported outside of Ghana. If it's not seen as an export, then the taxpayer would have been subject to further taxes because they should have charged VAT. In this case, the client didn't charge VAT. They treated it as zero rated. And so, and, and this, for me, this is one of the areas which went in favor of the taxpayer. The judge in this instance did not side with the GRA, but went ahead with information that um, in Ghana's uh, uh, law, we are using the destination principle, which means we are looking at where the uh, final services is consumed, or which country, and they are going to make use of the destination principle. And they went ahead to quote the OECD VAT guidelines, and then they also talked about uh, some, they made reference to a Kenyan Act, an Indian uh, uh, case law in this case, which 
I thought uh, was very necessary and has made the police of supply rules in Ghana, as we have it now, a little bit more understandable and provided the clarity. And I just mentioned that if these services are consumed outside of Ghana, then no VAT is to apply. Unfortunately, our law didn't talk about uh, or didn't define what consumed or used outside of Ghana is. Uh, and that's how come they went ahead to mention the Kenyan cases and the OECD VAT guidelines. And this, for me, uh, if uh, there is no appeal against this court, it confirmed for me that in Ghana, when it comes to VAT and export of services, we have to apply the confirmation of destination principles. That means when you have an international traded service or an intangible uh, uh, service, the jurisdiction of the customer is to be used. So in this case, the uh, service provided from Ghana, which is uh, used in the US or by Coca-Cola, is not supposed to be subject to VAT. And then you, uh, sorry, it's rather supposed to be a zero rated, which is also very uh, important for the client, which means they can even deduct their VAT inputs that they've been kept here in Ghana. So these are the three areas I want to share on this case. Well, well thank you very much. Um, so, uh, and Gideon has, has elaborated on, on some of the takeaways from this case, and we've also highlighted uh, this in the, in the tax rates areas that we discussed earlier. So I'll move to the, the last case that we wanted to highlight, uh, which is Cedro Ghana Operations Limited uh, versus the Commissioner General uh, of the Ghana Revenue Authority. Again, uh, another case that, that uh, was ruled on in 2022. And uh, basically, here the uh, Ghana Revenue Authority have conducted um, audits of the uh, taxpayer for 2012 to 2018. Uh, and the uh, first report was issued on 8 November 2019. And uh, the taxpayer was dissatisfied and so objected to this uh, report uh, on the 11th of December 2019. And subsequently, there were discussions uh, with the Commissioner General uh, that led to a decision being um, given by the Commissioner General um, dated 11 December 2019 and served on the taxpayer, uh, well, served on the taxpayer uh, on the 1st of December 2020. But various discussions uh, went on subsequently. Uh, the taxpayer remained dissatisfied with the outcomes of those discussions and uh, filed uh, a notice of appeal against the tax uh, assessment with the High Court of Ghana uh, on 8 November 2021. Uh, now, a GRA filed an application to the court to strike out uh, the, the appeal because the taxpayer had gone beyond the period uh, of 30 days that's provided under section 44 of the Revenue Administration Act uh, for a taxpayer to make an appeal to the court to be satisfied um, by the content of a tax decision uh, after an objection. The court considered various things uh, and ruled uh, that the, the discussions with taxpayer, between taxpayer and commissioner. Um, of uh, the Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority uh, could not go on on end and so ruled that the uh, tax objection, the objection that was indeed filed by the taxpayer was uh, in December 2019 and the taxpayer had a final decision uh, step it on 1st December 2020 so to wait and appeal uh, to the court in November 2021, almost a year after uh, it was uh, such a long time and had gone beyond the 30 days that uh, Section 44 of the uh, Revenue Administration Act allowed for objection and appeal to the court. So the court uh, indeed struck out the, the appeal and uh, that meant that the decision that the uh, Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority said on the taxpayer in December 2020 became final. And uh, this uh, definitely is a, it is a matter of time, and uh, there are interesting 
blessings that uh, I believe you can take out of this uh, in this environment of increased uh, objections, tax audits, and scrutiny. And Joaquin Water and those blessings that taxpayers uh, can take out of uh, this. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Um, I think uh, for me, uh, the great lesson that they are doing their work is to, to make their mind, think at their mind early. Uh, you, you have to understand how the channel works, and if you have to make an assessment of whether either you want to go to court, so once the audit is issued, report is issued, you object to the report, you wait for the chair to respond to your objection. The, the court is saying that the time the, or the date of that objection decision is the start of the count for the 30, 30 days to file your appeal at the court. So if you receive the objection letter, you then have to make a determination. Do you want to go to court or you still want to engage the chair? Because you don't have 30 days to file your, your appeal at the court. If you believe that you can engage better with the GRE for them to maybe consider your views on their report, there is a decision you take at the start. But if you believe that in a different position, you complete or you strongly disagree with the GRE and you believe it's only the court that can help you the case, then you don't have to wait to, uh, you know, uh, start better with the GRE. Straight away, you have to uh, apply to the court to appeal the case. So, don't wait for subsequent correspondence. It will not help your case. You will lose the opportunity to file the case. And even though if the, the court will have looked at the merit of the case, the task may have won on technical grounds, the case will never end. The task here was required to settle the liability. Yeah, right. So, uh, timing is key. Timing is key. And I, I believe that it's also a key uh, principle in FPT. Uh, that equity will not aid the indolent, uh, but the vigilant. So timing is key. That there are specific timings provided under the Revenue Administration Act. That we have to pay attention to those timings uh, when dealing or going through objection processes uh, when dealing with tax disputes. So I think that's very key. We will soon to quickly look at what the tax calendar for 2023 uh, would look like, and I would say that this is what you should have on your desk if you are a finance manager, uh, an accountant, a tax manager, uh, an FC, CFO, or anyone who has responsibility uh, relating to taxes. This is the calendar you should have, and uh, I will not go through all, but then basically highlighting uh, the key deadlines of filing would usually come with its payment. So we have the monthly uh, pension contribution returns, uh, which is uh, 14 for the other, uh, the following month, where 14 is a weekend, then it comes to the last uh, working day. Uh, you have the monthly withholding tax, PAY, withholding tax returns, found also 15 uh, day of the subsequent month, but again, pay attention to uh, when these fall on uh, weekends. Uh, now we have the online system that you can file, so please make sure that you are not missing your deadlines and especially also the payments because uh, payments, late payments comes with interest and that will be a high number for your business. We have the annual PY reconciliation and payment uh, of taxes for 2022. So the law allows businesses, and that's at the same time, businesses to reconcile for the year and make their payments, any differences, by the time you are filing December returns. That's also very important. Monthly SI duty, monthly VAT levy, CST. There is no reason to miss the deadline and having this uh, boldly printed uh, on your desktop or if you're keeping the environment as I would, I would suggest, keep this somewhere, uh, keep it even as your desktop background. You have a self-assessment and this is based on the assumption for a first January 31st December 
accounting year period. If your accounting uh, period is different, uh, then this would change accordingly. And then we are looking at uh, 1st January to 31st December uh, financial year. So you have a self assessment, employers' annual deduction set, which we tend to uh, waste uh, a lot of time. By the end of April of every year, we file for the prior year annual personal income tax and returns, annual corporate tax return due for 2022. Uh, if you can't meet it, apply for an extension. Uh, then we have the, the Office of the Register of Companies annual return and filing, and we should be doing that. Local file and master file uh, transfer pricing uh, documentation. If you have transfer uh, pricing issues or you have related party transaction, by end of April, if you can't make it, you put in an application. Uh, you have the self assessment, uh, quarterly self assessment also coming through. Uh, you have your uh, self assessment payments for the fourth quarter, the uh, end of December. Uh, Again, a very, very critical uh, date because by these dates you should have revised or assessed your provisional assessment for the year and make sure that whatever you are filing does not fall foul uh, to the 10% the margin of error and you avoid paying uh, under provisioning interest. So, this filing date. Uh, self assessment payment or final revision for the year 2023 will be very important. Speak to your taxpayer, keep this on your calendar. Then, CBC reports and notification for 2022. Uh, CBC is country by country reporting from a transfer pricing point of view. You have 12 months after the end of the year to file this with the transfer pricing units of the Ghana Revenue Authority. For 2022, this will be end of the year 2023. Another area that we should really pay attention to. If you are not uh, compliant with your transfer pricing report, master file, local file, speak to your consultants and have that in place. Because now you will file actually with the Ghana Revenue Authority and at the end of the year you file country by country uh, report. So we'll go into uh, take some of the questions that you have, you have brought to us. Uh, we have tried to answer a number of them uh, live. Uh, we'll take a few of uh, these questions um, also and, and, and try to address them. Uh, so we have, uh, so the first one uh, is mainly uh, a, a comment. So we had uh, we had one where we have um, a minute. Let me take that. So we had a comment around the uh, the abolition of the benchmark policy and a comment around whether this is sustainable. I believe that that uh, is a general comment. Uh, that is coming through, but the question is how sustainable uh, is local production. So when you are having uh, a, a hit on importation costs, so reversal of benchmark uh, value discount policy, uh, increased import cost, the idea is to eventually lead to uh, high local production. Uh, the question is how sustainable uh, are we? And our manufacturers ready to produce. I believe that uh, that uh, is, a, is, is a question for all of us to answer, but importantly, we we'll need to get our policies right to incentivize local production, local manufacturing, uh, to close the gap where we have gaps in the supply uh, that potentially will be reduced from imports. Um, the other question was 
to highlight more on the self clearing of goods. So I will call Joaquin to to just in a minute highlight on the self clearing of goods. What uh, this means, if you can just give a bit of uh, explanation, and also I will add this: uh, Can we have more elaboration on on how importers can avoid the one percent IRS tax deposit? Uh, because this person mentioned that they uh, they this company always provides it, but they do not get the exemption. If it's something that uh, you should be contacted and spoken to, please. Uh, let, let, let me come back. So, Jackie, please take these two together the self clearing and then the 1% to take a brief comment on the implications of government debt exchange program. All right, thank you, Bishop. Uh, I think the self because it's a new initiative that has come on board, we, we expect the DRA to come out with operational guidelines on how. Companies can now, you know, register on the portal. But we expect that uh, there will be registration on the portal. The the iPhone story, the iPhones that uh, will give access for people to register their business for, for the same permit. It's, it's still new. We don't have a lot of information on it yet, but it's, uh, we expect that to be on the iPhones and then to allow for companies to directly register in the business. Uh, on the IRS tax, I don't know whether you are, your agents are able to provide this when they are doing the, the clearing on your behalf. We well, expect that once this this data are provided during the declaration phase, the, the tax will not be applied. So maybe uh, we, we have to speak more to our agents to see when we provide them. We do provide these things in the declaration process for the custom for consideration during the process. Sometimes they may not provide tax so while they have to suffer at the taxes. You know, tax payers do not suffer these taxes when this, uh, the team is provided for the clients. So, more consultation with your agents and let them be aware. The reason why you, you, are, plan, you are giving out this thing for, for their consultation is the, the current process. Right, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, wisdom, we can yes. hear you now. Okay, right, right. So, uh, we also had a, a, a question, uh, a question around uh, what whether the, the, a company can has to pay. Uh, VAT uh, on invoicing a property society, so uh, farmers' corporate. Uh, I believe that this will be based on uh, what you are invoicing. Uh, if you are invoicing uh, a tangible supply, then you would have an obligation to charge your VAT. Uh, if the recipient has any form of exemption and there are procedures uh, to uh, get the relief from uh, the tax authority. Uh, we also have a question to, again, the IRS question uh, keeps coming up. Uh, we also have a question where, so I think based on the, the Coca-Cola ruling, um, Bismarck is asking uh, if it's if payments to parents entity for office rented here, phone bills, water canteen, whether those uh, those billings should attract VAT. So okay, you may you may you may take that. I don't know whether you, you fully understand that. So you may take that, but of course, I believe that the situation always uh, always deeper. So uh, in all cases, we would have to uh, look at the uh, this surrounding circumstances in detail to, to conclude. So I think maybe we can have a comment there. Then I'll call Gideon uh, to, to speak to whether there are any tax uh, implications for the current and uh, test testing program that's ongoing. Thank you, Gideon. Uh, 
Okay, so the way to write this so, uh, uh, this is a specific case based on specific circumstances. So, in as much as I try to address it in general principles, I think its application would be specific to each entity. So, building your parent company for office rent, utilities. So, the question I'll ask is what are you providing for the parent company? Are you providing certain, certain services for a parent company? How is your income generated? You earn income on the markup, for instance. So, the earn income on the markup. Then all these calls become your input before you apply the market. That becomes your revenue. And to the extent that the activities or the service you are providing for the company, parent company is subject to it, then we do apply on all these uh, utilities, uh, rent that you are seeking re reinvestment for. So it will still be uh, on a case by case basis. And each business has to accept their, their specific agreement, the specific activity they are undertaking before they can make a, a good determination of whether or not they have to charge back or not charge back. Okay, right. Thank you very much. And there was also a question uh, someone talked about the uh, VAT on on, in, on electronically supplied services. Sorry, I will call you in the, in the bit. So, uh, electronically supplied services. So from last year, which is 2022, the GRA allowed the mechanism for non-residents to charge VAT on uh, electronically supplied services for use and enjoyment in Ghana. So yes, if you are seeing uh, VAT on uh, services provided electronically from non-residents, then that is the reason and uh, it's allowed under section 16 of the VAT Act. Uh, if you're paying a non-resident for services, then uh, your obligation with relation to withholding tax is under the uh, Income Tax Act to withhold if the service fee has its source in Ghana. The GMA has explained that source in Ghana means where you bear the cost uh, in Ghana. So, yes, uh, in general, based on the GMA's practice notes and the law, you would have to withhold when paying. Yeah, so on the debt exchange program, currently ongoing uh, situation that remains for the yeah. Hello, Gideon, you are on mute. Okay, so um, if I was actually uh, providing a response, and uh, I think no. this is a very topical. Uh, question, a uh, question on the debt exchange program. And uh, I'll just give general comments on it, but uh, it's also very relevant that as you are looking at it, we have to consider the uh, regulatory oversight board in terms of the guidelines that they have provided. And because I know in the past, as an example, if it's a banking or financial institution, for example, regulated by the Bank of Ghana, and uh, then the Bank of Ghana's guidelines, GRA has been Times past relied on the Bank of Ghana's guidelines, relied on the Bank of Ghana's guidelines to be able to provide or use that as a basis for a tax deduction. However, in the car under the current law, it's nine six. If you are a bank, for example, and you have a specific provision, um, the law allows for the that debt to be. Hello, Gideon. For your books, I think that should provide you some ways to look at it in terms of getting a deduction. So it's not only clearly straightforward. You have to consider the Bank of Ghana guidelines, or if you're an SEC regulated body, what the guidelines is, and whether this will be seen as a specific provision uh, for you, the bank, or the investor, or depending on the corporate body. As it is now, for individuals, the law does not allow for individuals, the tax law does not allow for individuals to uh, deduct anything against, especially against their incomes. So for individuals, if you are in this case, uh, I'm sorry you are in the uh, hard luck. Unless maybe as part of this debt renegotiation regime, 
a specific tax provision is made for it to allow individuals in some way. Uh, I would think if they allow them to file returns or say uh, you could be able to allow, you'll be allowed to get some deductions going forward. So it's a lot more early stages yet, but I'm sure as time goes on, uh, there will be more clarity brought to this case. Right, right. Thank you, Gideon. And uh, so we, we there are several questions that we've tried to answer in life. Um, the ones that are pending, we'll take them and, and, and answer back to you directly. We we, are, we have some five minutes to go and would like to uh, move to. George, can you hear me? Hello, Izum. Okay, uh, I didn't hear you. I can hear you now. Yeah, right. So, we are all yours. Start okay. Start. okay. So, so um, thank you very much um, for joining the session. What we have now is that we have something new that we want to introduce to you. And so, please stay on and just uh, take part of this section. It's a wonderful session we are going to have. Now, we want to introduce to you what we call Deloitte Tax at Hand. Deloitte Tax at Hand is an app that we use. You can put it on your mobile phone. It can be on your, um, it can be on your laptop. Maybe let me just um, show you this one. Okay. So, so it, is, it is a mobile app or it's, it's something that, like I said, you can put on your um, on, on your laptop, very um, convenient. You are able to get information regarding tax information globally, not just um, in Ghana. You can also have the opportunity to interact with professionals globally as far as tax is concerned. You have information on ongoing basis. And so every country that you select that you want to get tax information on, you are able to get this on your phone. Any update that comes, you get it, an alert on your phone, and you are able to also share with your friends. You are able to save um, various tax topics, and then you can read subsequently. You can also have the opportunity to even customize your own page, and then select quick topics you want to um, get updates on. You can select which countries you want, the language you want, and then um, share on other social media platforms. And so um, it's a convenient, very highly inter interactive platform and connected to, uh, like I said, professionals globally. It's, it's, it is a global platform that uh, we have here. And so I'm going to give you the opportunity to have this on your phones or even download it on your laptops, and then you can use it, you can get interactions with people, you can ask questions, um, and then people will be able to assist in responding to the questions that you want to, do, uh, you want to get updates on. For instance, some of the topics that we have uh, discussed here, the updates that we have done um, as far as Ghana taxes is concerned, if you select Ghana, for instance, then you are going to be able to um, have um, the, the, the conversation um, as far as that is concerned. So just, this is the app. I'm going to go take you through how you can um, assess this on your phone. So let me quickly uh, take you through the process. You take your phone, you just um, take a screen of this and then it will be on your phone. You go to the process to register on, um, on yourself so that you can have your own um, email where you use to get the notifications, and then also you can have your um, alerts on your phone. Okay, so let me quickly share with you um, how you can access this as quickly as possible for you to enjoy it. Just give me a second. I 
please let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, your screen is big. Okay. So when you log in to the to the platform, you register, this is where it takes you. So for instance, I have decided to choose Ghana. So once I've chosen Ghana, I see whatever. So some of the topics we discussed, it changes to a VAT and e levy rates affected is here. The webinar we discussed is here. You can have it. Um key tax highlights for twenty. To the trade budget statement, corporate tax is here, and then you can come here again and decide that okay, I want to get updates or I want to get information um, for let's say Kenya. So you pick Kenya, or let me use Nigeria um, for this purpose. So I select Nigeria, good, and then you're able to get whatever information that. Uh, you you like to have as far as Nigeria uh, is concerned. You also have the opportunity to personalize your own page. So you come to this side, it's a personalized home page. So I come here, then I will decide on, um, okay, so this is me, um, let's just go. I want to put the personalized page and then um, is something not working with me. Yeah, the, please click the you have read and accept. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So, you should be able to take me to the page just a moment. Is anything the problem because I just did it? I think I, I think okay. it's it's not. Let me try it again. That page is not. Let me try it again here. Yeah. You also read. Uh, Sorry? So, so it's because you personalized yours already. Yeah, uh, so let me let me do yeah. this again. So back on the page, yeah, you would be able okay. to. Is this one? Are you seeing this one? Yeah. I see my screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you okay. can see it. You okay. can okay. see it. But okay. you have so personalized me... yours already. So, yes. Um, and that's it. So, your function, the industry, uh, exactly. And that to yeah. help to, to rate what. Is delivered to you exactly. I want to do that again, and then they can enjoy the how the app will. But if you have already downloaded it, you you'll be able to go through that. So yeah, I'm going back to to be able to get it so that you see the process. Very simple process, and you get all that you want to get. Okay, so I personalized my piece. So I said I want Ghana, I want Nigeria. And then I want South Africa. I can always go back to the jurisdictions I want as well. Okay, so these are the jurisdictions that uh, all the topics I choose um, first. So I choose um, business tax. I choose cross-border employment tax. I choose indirect individual taxation transfer pricing. You can always, like I said, go back and then edit your personalization to choose which ones you want to um Select depending on the country and the language that you want to use. Very interactive. Okay. So you come here. Can anybody tell me which country he or she wants? These are the countries I've selected. If you want, I can add Kenya here because I've added to it. Okay. And then there we go. Um, just a moment. Sorry, um, I had it came here to my page. Um,
I want to add more, more to my piece so that I can easily share about it. It was hiding. Apologies. The screen was hiding. So, okay. So I added that to my page, and then I can go back and do um, whatever I wanted to do on my page. Um, I don't know why this is going this way. Okay. Okay, so bring me to the page that I selected. Bring me to the page that I selected. Okay, so all the information that you want, you now can get it um, from the page. And that is how this app works. Okay, so I don't know if anybody has been able to download it and then yeah. we can go through. Yeah, okay. Has anybody downloaded so the, the, the new page you were showing and yeah, we could not see it, uh, but then I just tried the download and I could follow what you were doing. Um, so oh, okay. we, we still had the same changes page, but I could. Uh, so you can yes. see my page as, as I speak? Yes, uh, but then. Um, we, we, I followed and I, I was able to uh, follow and personalize uh, my own page. Yeah, yeah. So, so George, I, I think that so we can go to uh, the, the page where we have the QR code. Yes, I want to go to that page. Just give me a second. Let me pull this one down. I'll, I'll share that for you. Uh, okay. I'll share that with you. Right. I believe it's up and you can see my screen. Okay, so that's the screen there. So people can try it and then we see how it works on your phones. Okay. So George, I'll keep this here whilst we take the closing uh, remarks from you. Okay. All right, so thank you very much. And I want to again say thanks to everyone for participating in this year's um, Tax Outlook 2023. Um, like the discussion went, there had been a lot, lot, lot of uh, changes to the tax regime. Um, some have been passed, some are still in the offing. Uh, we are looking forward to those ones to uh, being passed. But as, as, as you get to know uh, what the outlook is, then that will guide you um as far as your the run of your business is concerned we have also discussed issues around um tax audits and what you need to do given some of the case laws that or the cases that have been um, held by the courts and the position that we're taking to serve as a guide on the need for processes that you need to put in place or the need for documentation and even the timing um of of responses that you need to put in place. All these are to help you to ensure that you work within the provisions of the tax law. Uh, interesting question that have come around the debt exchange and all that. Uh, we believe that by the time it's concluded, this debt exchange is concluded, there would definitely be some guidelines as to should there be um, losses being incurred as a result of some of these um, positions or some of these policies that have come to play, um, how from tax perspective um, we are going to uh, treat it. There may be some experiences we can learn from some other jurisdictions, um, which will help uh, the government in coming, up, coming out with policies around it. And so um, this year we'll also be sharing with you our tax training uh, calendar um, so that you know the various topics that we'll be treating um, in the course of this year. Um, we'll, uh, once you also have this app, uh, you'll be able to get uh, some of these notifications, like I mentioned, on your phones and on your, on, on your laptops to be able to be part of our interactions as far as tax issues are concerned uh, in Ghana and even where you have multiple jurisdictions where you treat. You'll be able to get information on what is happening um, across. You can select a region that you want, like I said, if you are working within Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, 
you'll always be able to get updates um, on on um, topics as far as tax is concerned and and latest information is concerned. So I want to say once again, thank you very much for joining this section and see you uh, during our next um, tax updates. Thank you very much. Goodbye from us. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.